Welcome back to the Widow's Oil. Today we are going to do a study of Hebrews 6 and what it means to enter God's rest. Now in previous studies I have discussed how um, it is very important that we repent from dead works and have faith towards God because those are the basic milk doctrines that are required for us to to progress. Peter also speaks of desiring the unadulterated milk of the word that we may grow by it. And if you will remember what Jesus said, Jesus said it is we must become like a little child, humble, in order to enter the kingdom of God. And people tend to focus on the fact of humility that becoming like a child means that we ought to um, be humble. But that is only part of it, because there is a deeper spiritual significance to this. Now, let us first speak about how important it is to become as a little child before we study Hebrews 6 fully. Um, and see what entering rest entails. Because this thing of becoming like a little child is not fully understood. So if we look here at 1 Peter 2, we see the, the scripture that says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Now remember what we said, in Hebrews 5, in one of my previous videos, we said there, um, it says in Hebrews 5, and right at the end from verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But we all must start as a little baby. A little baby that is um, on the elementary or first principles. And to understand these first principles, especially repentance from dead works and faith towards God, for else we will not progress. The heading here is the peril of not progressing, which is a very good summary of what Hebrews um, 6 and the first um, six chapters of Hebrews is all about. It is about not entering the rest and not progressing towards entering that rest. Now, even though we should mature, we, we first must be like a little babe in Christ, as it says here. As newborn babes desire the, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. And therefore, looking down on the milk doctrines is not what we should do. Jesus said, when they were saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He said, um, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, that is where the humility part comes in, because you see, if we in any way hold on to our own works and think that by doing anything above believing in Jesus, in other words, not put, putting our full trust in the work of Jesus Christ, then we cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that is what Hebrews 6 is going to show us um, and the whole first uh, six chapters of 
Hebrews. It is going to show us that we must repent from, from all works and that requires humility. That requires coming to a point where you realize that nothing you do is good enough and there is nothing that you can do. The only work required is to believe in Jesus Christ and that is the great stumbling stone and we all stumble on it. There are some people I have seen who from the beginning have a understanding and they fully understand it. But it does seem to me that if we come from a background where there is any form of works, any religion in our families, and that is just about everybody, these things make us stumble, even though we do believe in Jesus and we do love. We have a journey, just like the Israelites had to go through the wilderness when they left Egypt and before they could enter the promised land. In the same way, once we leave Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, with Jesus being our second Moses to lead us out of the spiritual Babylon. We also go through a wilderness period. And in that wilderness period, if we do not um, if we do not partake of these milk doctrines, just like the Israelites had to have the manna, and they didn't want to eat the manna, they wanted more and other varying different foods, in the same way we must have the milk. But we desire the meat of the word. We desire all manner of doctrines. Sometimes we do not even desire either the meat or the milk, but we desire the food of this world, all the philosophies. And none of these things are going to help us enter the kingdom of God. But we must first, like the Israelites partake, partook of the manna um, in the same way we must have the milk doctrines and that is where the humility of being as a little child comes in now let us read hebrews 6 it says there therefore leaving the discussion of elementary principles of christ let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work, and labor of love, which you have so shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patient, patience inherit the promise. For when God made a promise to Abram, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. 
for men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now let's just take a bird's eye view of what is Hebrews 6 telling us. It is telling us that we need to go on to maturity. And in order to do that, we've got to move beyond these foundational teachings. In other words, we have got to start to understand why doing all manner of religi religious works is not going to let us enter rest. And we get a great promise in Hebrews 6 that we, we will do this if God permits. And God has given promises that through patient endurance and holding fast to the things we received and holding fast to Jesus and holding fast to his word, he has promised that we shall enter into rest. Now he explains here, the, writers, the writer of Hebrews, that, that if somebody actually does enter into Christianity and partakes of it, but then falls away. In other words, does not stay connected to Jesus Christ because remember Jesus said he is the vine. And if we do not remain in the vine, we will be dry branches to and be cut off and thrown in the fire to be burnt. So what he is saying here is that, that um, if we do not, if we become a Christian, but we keep holding on to dead works, then we actually are not connected to Jesus Christ. And then we become this, these dry branches that are burnt. So what happens is those fellowships become dead churches. Um, if you read in in Revelation, it speaks of the seven churches, and there is one church uh, which was called Sardis, and which um, the Lord said to them, they, they need to repent because they are almost dead. If we look here in Revelation 3, we see the dead church, Sardis, and what the Lord says to them is, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. So this church is at the point of being spiritually dead. And it says, I have not found your works before, before perfect before God. So what people generally think is the exact wrong thing. They think that these people do not do enough works, but that work um, is the work of faith. Look here in John 6, verse 29, it says there, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. The, um, this New Living Translation also puts it quite clear. Jesus told them, the only work God wants for you, 
believe in the one whom he has sent. Now people think I say thereby we can do whatever we like. That, but that is not true because Jesus gave many commandments in the New Testament. Many, many commandments and they're at a higher level than the law of Moses. So when we speak the truth and say that the only work God wants for you is to believe in Jesus, then we get persecuted just like Paul did. And they said Paul um, is preaching lawlessness. And to this day, there are people who say Paul is preaching lawlessness. But this is what the scriptures teaches is that the work God wants from us is to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, the rest of chapter 6 of Hebrews gives us such a wonderful, comforting promise because it tells us that if we are not sluggish and we continue um, showing diligence and we patiently endure, and we imitate those who through faith and, and patience inherit the promises. And Jesus being the one we ought to imitate. And then we can also look at Paul and Peter. And sometimes there may be people in our lives that have entered rest. That also at them we can imitate what they do. And, um, and through those uh, examples, examples, those people who are witnesses um, of Jesus Christ. It says in uh, later on in Hebrews, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, there are many people who understand grace and understand what the gospel really teaches. If we imitate them and not imitate those who want to take us back to the law, then in due time we will enter. And it speaks here of how God swore an oath by himself because he promised the blessing and the multiplying to the seed of Abram. And that is a wonderful thing because God cannot lie. And it says here, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And in my previous teachings, I spoke of us spiritually being on a boat that is being tossed and turned and blown about by every wind of doctrine. But this hope is our anchor of the soul, it says here. And it it's going to make us sure and steadfast. So the hope is not in our works, in being good, but it is in the promise of God where he promised that if we, um, if we follow Jesus Christ, if we imitate the ways of Jesus, which enters through faith, then for us that will happen to, we will enter into the Holy of Holies, the presence behind the veil, because it says there, Jesus was the forerunner. He already entered and became the high priest. So Jesus is already in the heavenly places. Now, if we speak of entering the rest, it is the same as the Israelites physically entering the promised land um, under Joshua. So they first left Egypt of slavery. They had their wilderness period. And only those who believed entered the promised land. Likewise, Jesus leads us out of Babylon, which involves law-keeping, rituals, basically dead works of religion. He leads us into a wilderness period. That is, we enter Christianity. But even there, 
we need to to move towards maturity. So first, we've got to repent of doing all these works and just believe in Jesus. And then eventually we will enter into the Holy of Holies, which is the rest we are offered, which is understanding grace and having no more dead works, not serving the Lord through any works of our own, but fully relying only on the work that Jesus did for us because it says he entered for us, but we also enter and are there with him. And it says behind the veil. So if you think of a, a bride, she wears a veil. And then when she gets married, um, then they lift the veil. So in the same way, being united by faith through Jesus Christ and being with him in the heavenly places, that is being married, being part of the wife of the Lamb, being part of the new Jerusalem. But it is a process. We have to make white our robes and get rid of all the leaven of the Pharisees that stick to us. Now I want to look at little aspects of Hebrews 6 here that I've highlighted. The first year is where the Lord um, swore, surely bl blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. So that was his prom promise to Abram's seed, which is Christ. And if we are in Christ, then it is promised to us that he will bless us and multiply us. Now, if we look here in 2 Peter 1, Peter explains how we can be multiplied. We are blessed by being in faithful Abram, but let's look at this multiplication because it actually explains how we are multi how we get multiplied. Remember, Jesus also spoke of um, the sea that must fall in the ground, and when it falls in the in the right ground, it brings forth thirty fold. 60 fold, 100 fold. So that is speaking of multiplication. So let's see what it says here. Peter says in 2 Peter 1, verse 2 Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. So this multiplication that God does is by us knowing God and Jesus our Lord. Now that knowledge. Just like you get to know a person until you fully know them, in the same way as we walk with Jesus, learn of Jesus, we learn, we get to know him, and through him we get to know the Father. The Father draws us to Jesus, and Jesus brings us to the Father. Okay, so yeah, knowledge of God. And Jesus tells us what eternal life is. And this is eternal life, that they may, may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have seen. So eternal life, per definition, is knowing the Father and the Son. That is amazing. People think differently of eternal life, but eternal life is defined for us in the Bible. Remember, use the Bible. The Bible defines and explains itself. Don't listen to the traditions of men that give you ideas that are not biblical. So knowing God and Jesus, which we can do by studying the scriptures, prayer and faith, are key, but I must say one thing, and that is there is a false way called Gnosticism. Gnosticism means also knowing. 
And Gnosticism is a form of trying to get to God by means of knowledge. So we can't get by knowledge to God. The knowledge is just going to multiply us. We can only enter by faith in Jesus Christ. So this Gnosticism is focusing only on knowledge. And that's why Jesus said, you search the scriptures for you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are they that testify of me. So we must also not fall for this Gnosticism. And Jesus actually explains it to us. Jesus tells us in John 10 about Gnosticism and about other ways of trying to enter the kingdom of heaven, one of them being by works, but the other one being by this secret knowledge. Remember, Jesus said, if they say to you, he's in the secret rooms, don't go. So don't join secret societies or any religion of Gnosticism where it's all about hidden knowledge and secret knowledge. He says there, I am the door. And he says, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So that is why we must become like a little child and understand grace and repent from our dead works. We cannot enter by our works and neither can we enter by secret knowledge. So the knowledge that we have must mix with faith for us to enter rest because that entering in is a spiritual place we go to and that can only happen by revelation only by revealing from the revelation from the Father can we receive anything of the Spirit. Yeah, in Matthew 11, Jesus said to us, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So he, he reveals to babes, to those who by faith, follow Jesus and have repented of their works and do not try by all manner of works or knowledge to come to the Father because the Father must, must reveal these things. So yeah, is the well-known part in Matthew 16 where Jesus explains revelation knowledge. Jesus was asking them, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ or the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So when we speak here of entering the presence behind the veil, it speaks of revelation. When the father teaches us through revelation just like he taught Peter and Peter struggled he sometimes was carnal as we saw in that same part where Jesus had to rebuke him so it is a process of being converted but we are promised that if we patiently endure it will happen for us that the Father reveals the understanding of Christianity, the true understanding to babes, those who have had their milk doctrines and have had not um, held on to works and traditions. 
Hebrews 6, it speaks of entering behind the veil or entering rest. So we're entering rest. So we're resting from our works. We do not rely on doing works anymore to get right with God. We rely on the work that Jesus did for us and we believe on him. And that is um, what, why people do not enter that rest is it, we are told here in Hebrews 3, we are, we are um, told that why did the people fail or why do people fail is it says they cannot, they could not enter in because of unbelief. Remember that whole generation, um, they died in the wilderness and it was Joshua and Caleb and the next generation who entered in. And um, it says, it says the, because of the unbelief, they kept wanting to go back to the old ways. They kept um, missing the, the food and the ways of Egypt. And so they could not enter in. Now, if we keep wanting to go back to the law and go back to the system that looks like Judaism or maybe even Islam, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven because you are not being like a little child, humble enough to, to acknowledge that you, number one, are a sinner, and number two, that nothing you do actually merits entering in. Now, once you have faith, you will have works. Your faith will bring forth fruit. So please do not think I say that there are no um, signs of faith in a person. But understanding the fact that your works are not acceptable to God and that they are seen as filthy rags, as it is put in the Old Testament, um, we must understand that it is only by faith we enter in and unbelief will keep us out. We will become part of a fellowship that is a almost dead or already dead church. Now, Hebrews 6 clearly tells us that the fellowship like that, that is going backwards, that's going back to works, its end is to be burned. It's going to be burned. It is going to become full of false fire. And your works will be stubble and it will all burn, it will be all for nothing. So all this Hebrew roots and turning back to Judaism and going to Islam, it's all going backwards and it's all going to be burned, those works, because they are dead works. And yeah, in um, Matthew 23, Jesus tells us, about these false teachers today and these false re religions who are like the scribes and the Pharisees. He says there, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. So they shut up the kingdom of heaven because you cannot enter by, by behind the veil. You cannot enter into rest because they stop you. They do not go in and they do not allow you to enter in. How do they do that? He says they, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So, they lead you into doing all manner of difficult works and they themselves don't do it. So you can't enter in because you're not entering in by faith. You're trying by your own works, but they themselves are actually lawless. They don't even try to do the works. They keep 
making the uh, word of God void through their through their through their own doctrines and laws of men. So you see, you are shut out from the kingdom of heaven. You cannot enter rest. You cannot enter behind the veil because of unbelief. Jesus gives the true rest and he says, come to me all you who labor. In other words, try to enter by works of the law and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. His burden is not like the heavy burdens hard to bear that shut up the kingdom to you, but he enters in before you and you follow him and you enter in to that covenant of with him, the new covenant. And that covenant will give rest for your soul. Look here, it says, we have an anchor of the soul, sure and steadfast. Rest for the soul because it's steadfastly anchored into the rock that is Christ. 